Hi folks, <clears throat> hope you're okay today. Uh, we're looking at a series uh, on revolutionary Christianity and I uh, hope that you find this a blessing and an encouragement and I hope it, in, it encourages you in your walk with God. So let's come before the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your love and grace. And Father, I pray through these messages that your Holy Spirit would work and their thought would be blessed and encouraged as they come to know you as Lord and Saviour through your word. May they come to be impacted by your word and may they come to know your love. I ask this, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to turn to John chapter 13, John chapter 13. Verse 31 to 38. It says, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, Where I am going you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me after. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me truly, I say to you? The rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Chapter 14, verse 1 to 4. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also, may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Jackie Onassis was suffering from a pounding headache and she had cancer and it was taking its toll. Jackie had always been conscious of her place in history and as she was dying she wrote a letter uh, to one of her sons and he said this, Dear John, I understand the pressure you, you'll forever have to endure as a Kennedy. Even though we brought you into this world as an innocent, you especially have a place in history. No matter what course in life you choose, all I can ask is that you and Caroline continue to make me the Kennedy family and yourself proud. Stay loyal to those who love you. Love, Mummy. Jackie Onassis, or Jackie Kennedy, uh, became Onassis later, but she knew her place in history. She knew her death was a significant time in history and she was getting her family ready for that death and the Lord Jesus also knew a sense of history, he knew that it was his time for death and the Lord wanted his disciples to live when he was about to die a revolutionary Christian life, a revolutionary discipleship life. Friedrich Nietzsche the German philosopher said the secret of reaping the greatest enjoyment from life is to live dangerously. And this is the whole series that we're going to do. It's a series to encourage us to live dangerously. If you turn to John chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, we read, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him himself and glorify him at once. I want to ask a question. What is significant in your life? What are you bringing glory to today? Are you praising your money or your bank balance? Are you praising your sex life? What is the center of your life and what are you praising at the present time? If you turn to Daniel chapter 7, 
verse 13 and 14, we read these words. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. My friend, glory in the Daniel passage is for the Messiah. In our passage in John, glory is to Jesus. Are we living for the glory of God or not? The word glorify means doxia, which means exaltation. Are we exalting God? Are we exalting Christ? Merrill Tenney said the cross would become the supreme glory of God because the Son would completely obey the will of the Father. In the cross is the glory of Christ. When Christ came to die, he was doing the glory of God, and therefore he is to be glorified. And do we glorify Christ? Do we glorify him for what he did for us? Philippians 2, verse 4 and 11. Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross. Here it is, therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Glory upon glory upon glory. He gets the glory. Someone said, Rosanna Cash said, you don't appreciate what you have until you lose it. Let me ask you, have we lost sight of the glory of God? Don't we need to come back to that our lives are all about glory in glorifying God? It's not about your ministry. It's not about your family, it's about the glory of God. Is the glory of God the center of our thinking today? We think that we are the center. We think that we are important. We think that we are significant. But we're not. History is not marching to our tune. History is marching to the tune of Jesus. And so are we giving him the glory that he deserves? Let us turn to our next part. We've looked at revolutionary glory. Now we're looking at revolutionary love. Verse 34 of John 13. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There's a story of a wife in a chicken pen and her husband was dying, calling for help. She said, you get on with your dying and I'll get on with my plucking. <laughs> she wasn't too caring to her husband. We are all called as Christians to warm friendships and to love one another and to love the poor and the needy. It was a new commandment. What does the Lord mean by a new commandment in terms of love? Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. A new commandment is that the Holy Spirit will come and make a heart of love in you. Jeremiah 31, 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Verse 33. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time declares the Lord I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and that is what God wants to do within you he wants to make the loving person more make you into a more loving person by renewing you by the Holy Spirit that's what it means by a new commandment Ambrose for, for bishops, cried the crowd. Someone shouted and the whole assembly picked up the chant. St. Ambrose was flabbergasted he be, from catechism, not yet baptized, became a bishop in December the 7th, 374 AD. 
the first thing he did is he got rid of the wealth and gave it to a, his poor. His door was always open to receive others. He says, so those who have devoted themselves to pleasure, luxury, gains or honors are spectators rather than competence, combatants. They love their ease. End of quote. Do we? God as wants us to live a revolutionary love today. Teaching on love, John 13, 14, Now that is your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also wash one another's feet. 1 John 3, 23. And this is command, 1 John 3, 23. And this is his command to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourself have been taught by God to love each other. 1 Peter 1.22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, we ought always to thank God for you brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love of love uh, the love of every one of you has for each other is increasing. Galatians 6 2 carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. 2 Peter 1 7 and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. And so the question is are we loving today? Christianity is not about being in a club. It's not about being in a, a social group. It's not about being middle class and having a house and a car and a wife or a husband and kids and take, sending them to the best schools and it's all okay. That's not Christianity. Christianity is a revolution of love. It is a place where people are full of the love of God. And so the question is, as children, what are you like as children? Do you love your parents? The question is, as husbands and wives, do you love each other? Do you love your children? It says this, 50% of teenagers say that dads make no effort to spend time with them. Do you spend time with your children? As a dad, I did, I'd make sure I'd spend more time in my child's life instead of working so much, says one father. Uh, is that with you? And what are you like as a husband and wife? In the area of sex, money, do we, and prayer, are we engaged in love to one another? George Viewer says, if your radical discipleship does not start in the home, it has not truly begun. Third, revolutionary grace, verse 36, 38. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Have you ever tried to start something, but you failed at it? You've tried to do something, but you've made a mess of it. Well, Peter had done the same. He denied his Lord. He started out in the Christian life, but he, he fell on his face. So often we make mistakes. We are cocky. We say we can go on in the Christian life, but we fail. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful you don't fall. Beware of self-confidence. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Glancing this way and that seeing no one, he killed the Egyptians and hid them in the sand. Excuse me. This was Moses because he was self-confident. Because he was, was self-confident of his ability. And therefore he ended up failing. Be honest with yourself. Admit your weakness to God. Then turn them over to him and say, Lord, I... I'm not doing well in this area of my Christian life. Don't be hard on yourself. But remember that 
God will forgive you and give you the grace and strength to go forward, but be honest with him. Campbell Morgan says, in other words, I know the worst that is in you, Peter, but if you trust me, in spite of the worst that is in you, I will realize all your highest aspirations and fulfill your life for you. God knows what you're like when he called you. And God has called you to change you. Revolutionary hope. We've seen revolutionary grace that God will bear with you and be graceful to you and will change you, but you've got to be honest with him and acknowledge your failures and your mistakes. And then rev revolutionary love, uh, revolutionary hope, verse 14, 1 to 4. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is in John chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house and many rooms, if it were not so, what I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, and where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Judas failed. Peter had failed. And sometimes in life, we fail and we wonder where God is in it. One writer, Curdy Evans, student, died in 18, 1982. The mum writes in 2003. I lay on the hospital bed with Curdy for hours held between the wires and tubes, his brain dead but a live body. Don't scream, Heather, otherwise the nurse will drag you off him. Have you ever felt like that? She writes, at 4.30 in the afternoon, I walked out of the hospital. Why did I not scream the house down? She writes, grief is such a physical experience. No one tells you that it has all the symptoms of terror, but without the escape route of flight, it is a terror of the nightmare after the event and from which one can't wake up. She cries out in anger and desperation, please God, don't make me so alone. Why do we have to experience these difficult times? Jesus says in verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. In Christ are the resources of God. When we think we have nothing, we have everything. Faith in Jesus was what would calm our heart to what lay ahead, our trial shuts us up so we have to trust God. Then we realize he is God and all sufficient to get through because we lent on him, we looked to him, and he was faithful. Verse 2, it says that God, Jesus, has a prepared a place for us, many mansions. We need to get the big picture. We're going to spend life with Jesus in eternity. And that is the big picture. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. When we believe in Jesus, we are saved. And that is the big picture. We are going to glory. So I want to ask some questions here. No matter what happens to us, our resources are in Christ. No matter how dark the situation, no matter how despairing your situation is today, God has a place for you in heaven. And God is with you right now. Your security and your joy is in Christ. And so, do we prize Christ? 1927, Philip Larpentor von Ferrer, a wealthy nobleman, died and his stamp collection in 1921 was sold for $2 million. So it must have been a, an expensive stamp collection. So he bought stamps and they sold in the 1921 for $2 million. He really prized stamps. Little bits of paper, he prized them. Do you prize Christ? who is worth more than all the stamps in the world? Do you see him as everything in your life?
Are you going to trust him in the midst of your suffering? So we come to the end, and we have four points here that we need to go over. Number one, glory. Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our iniquities. The death of Christ brought glory to God. It brought glory to the Son. Are we living for the glory of God today? Is the glory of Jesus more important to us than anything else? Then, revolutionary love. They love each other even without being acquainted with each other, says the ancient says it was said about the ancient church are we a loving community as people of God revolutionary grace Boris Pasternak said I don't like people who have never fallen or stumbled their virtue is lifeless and isn't of much value life hasn't revealed its beauty to them chapter 13 in Dr. Shivago Boris Pasternak we all fail and we all make mistakes, but we need to come back to God, be honest with God and say, Lord, I'm failing in this area. Please help me. Not to be cocky, not to be self-reliant without God. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So revolutionary grace, God will forgive you and use you and restore you. And then revolutionary hope. You might feel the bottom has dropped out of your life and you might not see a way ahead. But Jesus says, let not your, let not your heart be troubled. In John chapter 14, 33, he says, my little children, as you live out the glory of God, as you live for the glory of God, as you live in the grace of Jesus, knowing his forgiveness, as you live in love and obedience to him, he will give you his hope. His peace will rest with you. However dark it is, however difficult it is, you have a hope today. You are going to glory. And everything might have been taken away from you at this present time. Maybe you have lost all your health and now you are on a hospital bed or now you can't do what you used to do. But you've not lost. Because as the earthly fades, you are going to the heavenlies. You are going to glory. You are going to be with your Father forever and ever and to worship and to adore him forever. I hope this has been a blessing to you, and I hope it's been an encouragement to you. Let's come before the Lord. Father, we thank you for your love and grace, and I praise you and give you the glory. And I pray that this message will be a blessing to all those who hear it, and may it be bring glory to your name. May people be saved and restored and renewed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. I I've got three more messages, so we'll see how we do. God bless you.